Cool. I think we have a couple of people joining in now. And as always, this session is also recorded so people can tune back into it. Thanks for all for joining us for another round of Twitter Spaces today. And I think today's topic is one of the one of the most interesting ones that we've had in a, in a long time, uh, along with the one that we did yesterday with the banking crisis as well. Uh, my name is Sam. I lead growth at Liquidity. Today, I'm joined by Boyan, who also helps us with operations at Liquidity. And our special guest today is Marcus, who will tell us about how he used Liquidity to buy a car in Guatemala. Uh, but before I begin, I think, Marcus, it would be great if you can give us a quick intro into who you are, how long you've been on, in crypto. And I think that will set the stage for, for your story. Sure. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Uh, really great to be here with you all. And uh, yeah, nice to see some some familiar faces and look forward to having us engage in this conversation today and really explore where crypto has its real world uh, impact and utility. So just a bit of background on myself. Uh, been in the crypto ecosystem for quite a number of years now. First time I opened a Bitcoin wallet and got some Bitcoin from a faucet back then. They were just giving it out it was in 2013 uh, and it was literally like, hey, please use this thing like we need people to adopt uh, Bitcoin. So that was really my first sort of foray into this whole world. And then over the course of the years, I've been in and out of the ecosystem, really passionate about how we bring about transformational change to societies um, by leveraging innovative technologies, uh, cultural change as well. And just really keen to particularly within the crypto ecosystem, like really put these um these technologies to the test and think about, okay, how do we move outside these relatively endogenous bubbles and sort of hype speculation mechanisms and, you know, radically transform uh, our financial systems, our governance systems, our economic systems, uh, among so many other platforms that we interact with and use on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that said, just really stoked to be here and, and look forward to getting this conversation going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for that intro. I think you know it's it's uh, it's great to see DeFi's real world use cases being put into action, and I think it kind of, it serves as a reminder that number go up. It's it's not the only thing that that we're trying to build, you know, and it's it's very far from the from the from the main thing that we're trying to build. Um, so you know, obviously, you've written this article in both Spanish and English. You've also got a walkthrough, but I think what'd be great to get started is, you know, what, what made you really decide to look at DeFi instead of CeFi? And how did your story of, you know, borrowing a car with DeFi actually begin? Maybe you can give us like a, uh, an intro into how that interaction went when you went into a bank and, you know, uh, you realize that the, the interest rates to borrow were over 20%. Uh, if you can give a quick insight into that, I think that'd be, that'd be good for us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So just, Quick bit of background here for, for those that are uh, maybe haven't come across this yet. I'm actually going to go ahead and pin up uh, this tweet where basically I walk through how I went ahead and bought a car using DeFi versus CeFi. So it all started with, you know, Juan, the need to get a car. I just uh, pinned Boyan's tweet up there. And really that was born out of this perception of, one, being very familiar with kind of the, the landscape of traditional finance in, in Latin America. I wrote a really big piece on, on this whole thing and really comes from this, this work that I, I was doing as a research fellow with the, with the EF and was exploring, okay, where does crypto sort of have real world utility and particularly looking at DeFi in Latin America. And so I had explored a number of different verticals. It's like a super comprehensive report exploring everything from like you know, mobile, the emphasis of mobile development all the way through to like blockchain scalability and privacy. So uh, with that, basically what I wanted to do was really put these things to a test and say, all right, let's actually build a um, let's let's build like an experiment around this. Right. So let's not just talk about how what, what the theoretical impact is, but I'm also someone who really loves just like testing things out, putting things to work and exploring. Well, how do we functionally kind of leverage these things in a really practical way so what i did was as i was looking to purchase a car which was uh chevrolet colorado was shopping around and then you know found found the car that i wanted and what i said was let me go to the bank and let me see what they can offer me and really this was to have a control with regards to uh, the experiment that i wanted to run so i went to the bank and asked them hey 
you know, I'd love a loan. Uh, what can you give me? And so, you know, the clerk, it was probably about like a 30 to 45 minute long process. And the clerk just sort of ran through everything and eventually was like super glad to tell me that they could definitely get me a loan and they could do that in the span of three days and it would be immediately in my bank account. Um, he, you know, sort of failed to mention the rate that I would be charged or any of the terms. It was just like, hey, let me give you this loan and you should just take it and don't don't ask too many questions. Um, and, and this is just as a sort of first step when we think about traditional finance in Latin America and the way people currently interact with their financial systems. Like this current is sort of the, the status quo, let's say, with regards to how folks think about the their financial sort of like lifestyle, right? And so oftentimes, you know, getting a loan for a motorcycle, a, tel- uh, a cell phone and a whole bunch of other um, kind of day-to-day purchases or, or, or bigger stable purchases happen with loans. The problem is that people don't oftentimes take into consideration uh, the interest rate that is given to them. And as a consequence of that, end up falling into like these really predatory and usurious loans. So what what happened in this instance is I said, hey, so let me get let me get the interest rate. He like had to sort of click away. And then finally he was like, okay, you know, great news. We can get it to you for 24% uh, APR. And and quite frankly, that's like pretty decent, you know, um, I, and I and I sort of mentioned this in other places as well. But there are, you know, instances where one would be charged an interest rate of like one percent a day, which if, if you don't have like the financial acumen to say, OK, one percent times three hundred and sixty five, um, that comes out to like a really substantial rate on an annual basis. So what then happened is. Uh, people end up getting into these really, really sort of expensive loans and then can't come out of the poverty poverty trap as a consequence of being, uh, you know, sort of trapped under this debt. So really the intention with this experiment is to say, well, if we're spending, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars here um, on vehicle purchases and mobile purchases and bicycle, motorcycle purchases, et cetera, and people are paying like super high interest rates, like what are the, what are their theoretical alternatives out there? And and that's when I started looking at, you know, DeFi. And I mentioned this in the video as well. I've been quite sort of in, in depth in the ecosystem. Um, but when I came across when I came across this experiment, I was like, well, let's let's put these two up. So super familiar with a whole bunch of different, you know, DeFi protocols and have been using them and involved in some of their earlier iterations as well. And so, you know, I think by that said there were four parameters and I laid this out in, in the article and video that I mentioned. So I wanted a protocol that was gonna be decentralized super easy to use that would offer me a low interest rate as well. Um, and the other factor was, I'm blanking on it right now, um, but I'll get back to it because I, I think those were like really the, the three primary ones for me, quite frankly. It was like, how decentralized um, and trustless is this mechanism? Like how easy can I use it? Um, and also like, what's the lowest interest rate, right? And so as I started going through these different sort of parameters and, and comparing each of the different DeFi protocols, I was like, well, could we use Aave or could we use MakerDAO um, Liquidity as well? And I'd, I'd been in talk with, touch with Bojan quite a while ago uh, regarding some, some research I was doing as well. And, you know, I, I think Liquidity ultimately just ended up being the one that, that fit all of those parameters at the end of the day for me. And, and so that was really just like, okay, let's just stick with this. Um, and then, you know, functionally what I did was record a whole video and write an article on it as well, which has gotten a lot of attention throughout the Latin American and sort of wider ecosystem, which has been really awesome to see. So that's a bit of kind of context and background. And I know we're going to explore a whole bunch of other topics and issues here, but, you know, that sort of gives the, the high level overview. What ended up happening is ultimately ended up going with liquidity. And then what ends up, you know, sort of the outcome of that is one, I can take out a 0% interest rate loan plus, you know, the base rate fee. Um, and interestingly, you know, it's not like directly comparable for me the the baseline was like we have the tradfi loan and then what is that sort of final transaction look like with the when it when it comes to actually like giving the seller of the car those funds like it wasn't just like okay at you know sort of uh one would look at liquidity and say it's a zero percent interest rate loan but no there's actually a whole bunch of steps involved right so you have to like swap uh you lusd up to some token that like perhaps is more widely used uh, particularly with some of these Latin American exchanges, in which case that might be USCC or USCP, right? So there's like a swap fee involved. There's gas fees you have to pay. There's on and off ramp fees you have to pay. And all in all, after that entire process, it still comes out to about 7% of the of the ro- loan if you're assuming about a $20,000 uh, 
uh, loan for a car. So, you know, if, if you really compare these two, and this is something I do in the article, is I say, like, listen, if you take out a loan with TradFi at a 24% interest rate loan, which is what I was offered, versus a in the sort of most uh, uh, expensive scenario, you'd end up paying about 7%. So it's still, like, substantially cheaper uh, to take out a loan using, using DeFi, despite all these other factors. So, and I know there's a bunch of nuance and questions we'll get into, but that's a bit of a sort of super high level overview and happy to explore all these, uh, details into more, but yeah, go for it. Yeah. Thanks for that intro. That's really, really interesting. And I would just have two intermezzo questions. So to say before Sam continues one, those 24, 25%, is that really like, like a standard rate in LATAM or is it just in a few countries or what's, what's the lay of the land? Yeah, so generally you're, you're looking at with, with car loans, you're looking at like 20 to 30 percent is like for sure very standard in Guatemala um, and, and much of Latin America. You know, one of the things about these financial systems and the broader kind of challenge with Latin America is there's like a huge centralization of power. Um, we, we come from these post-colonial uh, structures of societies. And so oftentimes what ends up happening is the banks collude with the businesses and the businesses collude with government. And it's created this sort of like perpetual uh, collusion circle, I suppose. Right. And so like a lot of these banks aren't necessarily designed to like serve the people per se. Like they're generally optimized to serve like really big corporations. So those who can access lower interest rate loans are generally like some of the bigger corporations. So it really just depends, but for sure, for those who are unbanked or who are underbanked, you know, th these rates are like certainly nothing outrageous. Um, and, and that's where I personally believe that, you know, DeFi has sort of its, its strongest opportunity. Okay, cool. Um, and the other question about circumventing the, the off-ramp fee and swap fee and all of that that you encountered. Here, uh, here in the Balkans where I live, there are quite a few groups where people uh, sell banks, phones, computers, whatever, also cars directly for crypto. Wanted to know if this exists. I mean, I guess it exists, but did you look into those kind of deals as well? Um, yeah, I did. I did look into some of those deals, but, you know, I think the, the biggest, if you look at the breakdown, and I actually just put in the tweet there, like for sure, the biggest challenge is the on and off ramp. Uh, I know we've got someone here in the audience from Bolivia. And from what I gather from what he shared with me recently is that like Bolivia monitors the transactions you have and prohibits you from like interacting directly with crypto. So just like I think generally that's the, that's the challenge here. Um, so if we could think of circumvent that and create more of an internal economy within the ecosystem, I think that's like a huge, huge value to the space. Um, but, you know, I, I, once until we overcome that, that unfortunately, in my in my opinion, is like the most uh, restricted bottleneck as far as mass adoption goes in, in many ways. Uh, that, thanks for those answers, Marcus. I, I had a few more questions. I think yesterday, uh, if you listen to our banking crisis spaces uh, with Meltem and a few others, highly recommended, by the way, guys, in the audience. It's recorded. It's also on your timeline. We discussed how, you know, every dollar is not equivalent to the same dollar. So what, what I think uh, Mel, Tim, and the guys meant by that is that, you know, with the the U USDC stuff that happened a few weeks ago, where a, a portion of their funds were uh, were in, I, I believe, Silicon Valley Bank at the time, and, you know, obviously de-pegged and caused issues, and the same thing with uh, kind of cascading effect onto fracks and die, like coins that are heavily collateralized by by USDC, I think it caused like a, a panic and a cause for concern. I wanted to ask, you know, when you did choose liquidity as the protocol to take out the loan, how much of a factor was the immutable aspect of it? And, you know, the fact that LUST obviously is just overly collateralized only by ether and nothing else. How much of a impact was that when, when you decided to choose liquidity for the loan? I mean, the thing about this whole ecosystem and, and quite frankly like one of its core underlying value propositions that um, I think oftentimes is, is sort of swept under the table um, and, and this is the saying right is like decentralized doesn't decentralization doesn't matter until it does right um, or trustlessness doesn't matter until it does and so 
and and quite frankly i think that's like definitely the right perspective is most people are like oh don't worry just use this like super easy super convenient uh mechanism and that's not to say you have to like fully sacrifice decent i don't think they're sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum i think it just requires more intentionality with regards to how we decentralization so um i would say that like you know and, and that's where i mentioned this one other factor that was like about decentralization it was like creating an anti-ruggable system so you know i've had friends uh who here in guatemala have had their bank accounts shut down because they interact with crypto right or they uh are involved in the ecosystem so for me that's like a huge huge cause of concern for me and i think a huge consideration like you know i'm, I'm right now at a conference and i'm with people from venezuela and argentina where crypto crackdowns are super real, Bolivia as well, right? And so there's nothing to say that like a bank at some point, at some point just because you don't necessarily have like a, a preference for um, the fiat system and much prefer to interact with these trusted systems, like they can't just censor you financially, right? And so I think that like, that's like one of the big sort of concerns with regards to how people end up using some of these other, and, and this is something that I was talking about with some friends the other day, I was like, imagine if you have like, how hard is it for you to explain to like your average day person? And yes, in theory, like the USDC event was somewhat of a black swan uh, incident. But imagine on that day where someone thinks they have, let's say, $1,000 in their account. And all of a sudden, it, it, it drops down to, um, what was it, like 890 Like, how do you explain that to someone? You're like, oh, there's this thing called Silicon Valley Bank. And because of the Fed interest rates and now they've defaulted on their bonds or that, you know, there's all these sort of banking crises going on globally and everyone's just trying their money. Like you can't do that. Right. And so creating like this super resilient um, and also immutable uh, mechanism, I think is huge, 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 huge. And, and something that has, as I mentioned right at the start is like sort of swept under the rug these days, to be honest, and, and not at all the direction I think we should be taking things in. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Uh, so could we could we kind of walk through the, the process that you took? So I'm guessing that you used, I remember for the article, you said you mentioned a DeFi saver as the front end of your choice. So before we touch into that, I, I just want to understand. So you took a loan out using DeFi saver. Uh, I believe uh, the collateralization ratio that you used what was around 250%, if I'm correct. Uh, could you explain to us like uh, step by step uh, high level, um, or how how do you took out the loan? How you off ramp? What off ramp did you use in Central America as well? I think that's another one for us to understand as well in the Latam region. What uh, what people use? How easy was it? Um, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so once once I had decided to use liquidity, um, the sort of next step that came after that was okay. Let's sort of think about the front end. So as many people here in the audience probably know, that we doesn't run its own front end, so you have to rely on other ones. Some of them have, you know, kickback rates, others don't. Um, and so I just ended up going with DeFi Saver. Uh, it really, a lot of this started with me posting a tweet. Um, and I just said, hey, I'm thinking of taking out a loan and uh, I'm considering liquidity. You know, what, what recommendations do folks have? One, one thing that I was concerned about and, and wanted to take into account was, uh, the extent to which, and, and again, like I'm always ruining myself and like, how could a, an everyday sort of average person use this? And um, what what emerged from that was saying, okay, let's use, let's use um, a protocol that is super easy to use, you know, where I can collateralize it with something that's like relatively well known after Bitcoin, right? Like Ether is sort of the most well known digital asset. So once I had sort of established all those things, put out a call on Twitter, the next step was let's go on to the, the, the front end options. And this was a front end that was recommended quite frequently and I sort of interacted with in the past as well. And that was DeFi Saver. And so, yeah, basically when, when you go on DeFi Saver, and again, I detail this much more in, in the article that uh, I pinned up there and, and a whole video that I did. So when you go to DeFi Saver and what's really neat about DeFi Saver is it gives you the option to set up a simulation wallet. So you can actually sort of like play around with uh, different numbers, you can think about different scenarios. And so that's what I was doing, right? And just thinking about like, okay, you know, are the markets like super overextended right now? Are they not? Like, where do I generally see the price of, you know, Ether going? And, you know, how do I want to deal with the risk of liquidation? That's always, you know, the risk when you set up a, a trope um, in, in what were, you know, a CDP in, in any uh, lending protocol is the risk of you being liquidated. 
And the really neat thing as well about liquidity and, you know, one of the reasons I decided to go on that is because it's super capital efficient, right? So it's only 110% uh, over collateralization rate. So, you know, you can play around with that health factor and you can also embed all these different uh, mechanisms, which I'll speak to in just a moment. But anyways, once I was sort of playing around with the simulation with different values and sort of exploring the loan of the, the value of the car and the amount of uh, collateral that I wanted to input into that, I decided to go with a 250% uh, over collateralization ratio. Uh, granted, this is like probably super, um, I, I'd say like conservative. You know, I, I, I think I saw that Melton was saying she sort of keeps hers at 150, uh, it keeps an eye on the market and just sort of stays in touch with, with the direction of things and will add collateral if needed at a certain instance. So, you know, there's also that approach and, and it, it is certainly much more capital efficient and you're likely to see like, moves on any given day um, that would put that at, at risk. But for me, it was just more of, okay, if I want to use this as like a long-term bet, um, then I, I just don't want to necessarily worry about this. Uh, there are other strategies here, and there's something that we sort of explore a lot in this Twitter thread that I posted, uh, which is also linked in, in the article. But, you know, could you potentially like hedge your bet? And, and I started talking to Sam and a few other folks within the liquidity community, and it was like, hey, could you potentially like um, hedge the bet? or heads alone um, and, you know, a whole bunch of other mechanisms. But quite frankly, at the end of the day, I was like, I'm just want to keep it simple. It's like over probably three, four year uh, period of time. So I just want to, you know, in, in the worst case scenario, just be super secure. Um, and so with that, I had a liquidation price of, I think it was like eight or $900 uh, ETH, right? And, you know, in my opinion, is like the likelihood of that happening is certainly not a non-zero event, but uh, highly unlikely, right? And so just wanted to kind of make sure that, that I was safe on that front. And that's how I took out the loan with regards to the off-ramping process after that. I went ahead and withdrew that, swapped that to USDC, uh, with, and then sent it to a, it, it's sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, but they're a little bit more of an informal uh, sort of off-ramping partner here in Guatemala. They charge me a fee and then boom, it, it goes into my bank account a day later. So that was a bit of the process, but yeah, Boyan, go for it. I know you have your hand up. Yeah, so I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, I would have uh, just a comment on the collateration ratio. I think that 250 for your use case is perfectly fine and perfectly reasonable. Uh, though I was surprised when, when Melton yesterday said like 150 and she uh, said that it's like a nice, uh, safe ratio. That kind of surprised me. But that's off topic now. Um, I'll play a bit of a devil's advocate regarding to the threat that you mentioned, because a lot of people uh, mentioned to use a stake ETH variants, which obviously liquidity does not offer and uh, will not offer for uh, good reasons. So uh, what's your take on that? Why not go with stake ETH? And how is your just thought process around ETH versus stake ETH? Yeah, that's a really good question. So a lot of people were saying, well, you know, aren't you sort of missing out on potentially uh, some yield with regards to the amount of uh, the amount of yield you could get on, you know, some sort of liquid staking token um, or you know, staking your ETH otherwise and being able to use that as collateral. And quite frankly, for me, is like uh, none of the staking protocols quite yet are truly like as decentralized as I need them to be to feel like entirely comfortable. You know, uh, I, they, they're taking the steps in the right direction. There's a couple of really uh, awesome, exciting projects that are in the works that give you more self-sovereignty with regards to ETH that you're staking. But for me at that, at that instance, it was like, oh, okay, uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure if this is really the, the kind of direction that I want to take this in quite yet. What we've seen, and, and you know, this is not just like a theoretical question, right? Like we've seen not just one, like the staking protocols themselves, uh, which again, have questions with regards to the extent to which they're truly like incredibly neutral and permissionless. But m moreover, like with the platforms that do offer, you know, up with that have upgradable smart contracts that can change um, the, the smart contracts, what ends up happening. And again, we've seen this in, in relatively recent history is uh, very easily with a multi fade you can just upgrade the contracts and for whatever reason, withdraw your funds or uh you know sort of change the, the debt position that you have and so for me you know i think that n having a non-existent governance mechanism having unupgradable smart contracts 
and and again, these are all all things that are up for debate. And I always see decentralization utility as as uh, something to, to balance. Um, again, not in sort of opposite ends of the spectrum, but certainly just things to always sort of keep juggling simultaneously. So that was really the the intention here. And you know, that's not to say that like uh, staking your ETH is necessarily a bad thing per se. I just think there's a bit of a, a long way to go before we can get to uh, you know somewhat or as fully trustless as possible staking uh, protocol and uh, being able to use these in, in as trustless as ways as possible. So, and we're already seeing some experiments come up uh, with that, right? So obviously I think that was one of the big challenges with Rye and a lot of people sort of questioning themselves like, well, why wouldn't I just input ETH? And, you know, they're now working on Thai, which integrates um, some liquid staking tokens in the equation. But again, it's, it's, comes down to like personal preference at the end of the day um and i also just really appreciate the fact that like you know sort of along the um within liquidity right it's this idea of like zero percent interest rate versus you might have a variable interest rate on another protocol uh that ex does accept some sort of state teeth uh derivative cool thanks so much for that marcus um uh I, I would also just add to that. I, I guess one of the reasons why you also stuck with a protocol that's immutable and also on layer one instead of layer two is probably because of the guardrails that layer twos have at the minute, correct? Would you assume correctly? W is my assumption correct in that in that sense that that's one of the reasons that you chose liquidity as well compared to some of these layer twos which have, you know, some uh, uh, they're essentially in beta phase still. Uh, with with uh, with with the decentralization aspect of it, but just want to hear our thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean for sure. Like like uh, quite frankly, I I do believe that layer twos are the solution to Ethereum receiving mass adoption. Um, and also at the same time, the challenge with regards to a lot of these protocols, or sorry, the, the layer twos themselves, is the fact that they do have sort of a, a very centralized nature by having single sequencers, for example, right? And so at any, or, or being controlled by a multi-sig as well as in the case of, you know, some side chains. So really at the end of the day, it's like, how do we, how do we really enforce and adhere to decentralized and permissionless uh, code, which is what we're all here for, because if, you know, we're going to be behest and subject to, oh, at any instance, I can just, you know, change the code of, of um, this smart contract or this layer two and, would that potentially put you in harm's way? Well, that, you know, to some extent, you're sort of, uh, in my opinion, getting rid of one of crypto's sort of core underlying utilities. But I, again, I, I will really overemphasize the fact that I, I for, and that, that's been the case for a lot of folks, it's especially with like how crazy gas fees have been, right? Some people are paying hundreds of dollars again for uh, to transact on mainnet. And, and that just, quite frankly, isn't sustainable. Like that will drive up the... Uh, capital efficiency of your loan as well. Um, so I, I, I think there is a lot of work to do with regards to the, de the decentralized nature of a lot of these uh, layer twos. But by that said, like, I do think that one has to sort of exercise their own uh, consideration here and excited to see where the space continues to grow and expand towards that uh, that way. Very cool. And before I open it up to the, the audience for some questions that they might have as well, I guess uh, one final one for me is uh, what would you recommend to the wider community who's, you know, from your experience of having taken out a loan off ramp to buy, buying a car, like how, if you had some key tips, let's say, uh, what would those be for, for the average Joe to, uh, to follow? For sure. Yeah. Um, Quite frankly, I would say that it's super straightforward to use. Like, you know, I, I took a loan out in like the matter a matter of minutes. Um, and so, like, if, if you're considering doing the same, like, do read the article. It's available in Spanish and English. Um, there's a vlog in both Spanish and English as well. And so, if, if you know, this is sort of a consideration that you're looking into or you're thinking about, well, how can I sort of use liquidity or some other lending protocol in a similar fashion, like. Again, th this is like wh where I think crypto has its its uh, really kind of strong uh, potential. And so one, just like start there, um, look into that. And if you're keen, you know, and, and you want to take out a loan or you need some support or have questions, you're always super happy to chat and feel free to reach out. Um, and, and other than that, you know, I also I know there's a lot of builders currently in the space as well. So 
but it's also I, I put in a bunch of like challenges with regards to where things got a little bit sticky um, along this whole process. So one was the on and off ramp. And there are people really working on creating these uh, harmonious sort of on and off ramp uh, networks whereby it doesn't matter where you are in the world, what network you're interacting with um, or what token you have on and off ramp should be just this super seamless experience. So, you know, I think that that's a huge bottleneck and certainly like an opportunity for builders to work on and something that anyone who's considering taking out a loan should be uh, aware of uh, and, and likely will be where, where you end up losing a substantial amount of the value that, that you get to withdraw from the protocol. Um, so if anyone has any good thoughts or, or comments here with regards to on and off wrapping, I, I'd love to hear those and, and how we can overcome that challenge. I'd say the other problem as well, and this comes down to like, or well, question is the, the extent to which like you want to over collateralize your loan. Again, I went like fairly conservative here. Uh, you can within DeFi savers set these automated features that allow you to take profit. Let's say the value of, of ETH appreciates, you can take profit along the way and reduce the exposure you have on the loan uh, or, or vice versa. If ETH is falling, you can reduce the amount of risk that you have on the table. Um, and so, you know, that that is another really awesome approach as well. Um, and, and certainly something that I would recommend folks uh, look into, particularly within DeFi Saver. Um, but yeah, those are those are some of the kind of higher level considerations and, and tips. But again, if anyone has any like serious practical questions, like do feel free to, to reach out in the DMs and happy to provide uh, my insights there. If I could just uh, mention two offerings, because that's, that's really the, the biggest uh, pain point. Uh, one, which I use personally as well a lot, and I have no affiliation with them or whatever, is called Mont Pelerin. They are Swiss-made. They um, service 170 countries, I believe, and um, the fees are reasonable. I think 1% or 1 point something, but you can lower that. doesn't matter. I like them, so Mont Pelerin. The other, as I see Anton in the in the space, space as well, uh, Anton is uh, building or has built Holy Health, and Holy Health is a debit card which you can top up uh, with crypto and then pay with it. And they are also enabling or will enable liquidity loans to be used to top up that card. That's a handful, but that's a mouthful. So you can take out a loan, a one click loan, liquidity loan and uh, top up your card with it. So two cool offerings you could, you could uh, buy. I don't know if you could buy uh, a car with it, I guess there are some limits, spend limits, but you could probably bar, uh, buy uh, a motorcycle or definitely a beer. So Holy Health and Mont Pelerin, two very cool decentralized uh, non-custodial options to offer. Yeah, good that you mentioned that, boy. And I believe with Mont Pelerin, I think they don't have KYC up to certain amounts as well. So I think it's... Yeah, 3,000 yeah. francs or 1,000 per month. No, 1,000 per day, 15,000 per month, I think. But check that on the website. I'm, I'm not sure. Awesome. I, I really love um, these types of services that like allow you, say, to like, spend your crypto directly to a card. I think that, that that's a huge value and um, definitely would love to hear more. Um, from Anton at some point and, and maybe bring him up and hear more about sort of the, the thesis with regards to Holy Held and where things are heading to next. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great segue for, for some questions and some comments uh, as well now. Um, yeah, Anton, if, if you'd like to come up to the stage, I'm happy to uh, bring you on and maybe you can uh, not shill your, your company, but give a, give a bit of insight into Holy Held and what it is for the people as well. And for anyone else, for that matter, if you could just uh, raise your hand, uh, if you have any comments or questions for Marcus and, and myself as well, uh, feel free to do that and we, we can answer. As for are coming up, like I would definitely, you know, I, what, what I wanted to prove with this kind of example was to showcase like, this is not even sort of this theoretical concept anymore. It actually is like super practical. We can change traditional financial systems. Um, they they are significantly better than than 
DeFi is significantly better than TradFi right now, particularly in the global south. So, you know, that's where I personally think like the real opportunity lies. Um, and we, we have to keep sort of building and focusing on like censorship resistance as well, because I can tell you just as, as the reason they're so inefficient is also kind of what empowers them to, to, to shut you out of um, these kind of traditional financial uh, spaces as well. So you know, projects like Holy Held, which I'm glad uh, Anton is up here on stage, like I think are crucial with regards to, okay, how do we continue to sort of scale the adoption of this technology? And I know we have quite a few Latin American members here in the crowd. So if you guys want to come up here as well, we'd love to hear from you and get your thoughts on how we can leverage DeFi to uh, create more financial freedom uh, in, in the global south. But hey, Anton, great to have you here. Uh, hey guys, sorry, didn't mean to um, didn't mean to interrupt. I was just listening. Um, and great conversation. Just wanted to um, to say kudos to you know to you guys and uh, and Marcus. Um, and uh, I think yeah, you guys are bringing up a very very important point. And um, I guess just a few thoughts. Um, in a sense that we've been talking as an industry um, for this mass adoption for quite a while, and there's been many different attempts uh, from different angles. Um, I think I think this it's still a long road ahead um, to really uh, mass adoption, um, and I think a part of that is it is indeed a very complicated space. Um, traditional finance, it's very regulated and it's very um, how does a way to say it? Uh, very regulated um, differently in different regions. So unlike what we think about DeFi, where um, user from two different countries can interact with the same protocol with the same rules and uh, same knowledge or same same amount of information or same amount of access um, when it comes to traditional finance uh, two users in two different countries would mean two different sets of possibilities um, so what you guys are um, talking about and um, this specific use case here about the uh, DeFi lending and loans and how you can utilize that um, just a thought here is that I think that we have a very good um, call it a base level infrastructure. So the protocols um, and infrastructure that allows you to take loans. Um, so it is up to us, um, community builders, uh, protocols, projects, um, to pick up this existing infrastructure and to build um, things on top of it. So that is uh, that is what is amazing about Liquid Team. And Anton, would love to hear more about Holy Held and maybe just like, wh where do you guys see your role in, in driving mass adoption as well and, and enabling more folks to come into DeFi? Um, what I see is this. I am an advocate of um, self-custody, and that's why we um, center it in the entire service around self-custody. Um, you, um, you order your card by uh, connecting your wallet and paying on-chain. Um, you, um, you top up your card through on-chain. Um, and um, I think that um, there's been also a lot of conversations around how self-custody is more complicated and users can forget their seed phrases. Um, your, um, you know, your, your seed can leak and uh, it's, it, it's less um, or more expensive, especially if you try to interact on uh, Ethereum L1 than, for example, on centralized, um, through centralized means. Uh, where I see us, um, I see us as an option um, for people that... Uh, want to self-custody that understand the importance um, and I see us as that service or as that medium uh, or medium layer that um, will connect um, whatever uh, primitives um, that others can build on chain um, to the traditional um, finance and world um, as as it is the world right now um, as we live in um, you still need fiat um, you still need fiat to um, pay for your rent, to buy your car, um, you know, even to go and get the coffee. Um, there are many places and there's many more that are starting to accept crypto. But um, we have to understand that they do not really accept crypto. Yes, you can pay in crypto, um, but the merchant never really touches the crypto because there's a service behind the scenes that converts um, crypto to fiat and uh, fiat is what the merchant gets. Um, so until the full life cycle of that supply chain um, can accept or uh, is able to accept crypto, uh, we still need the traditional fiat, um, fiat system. And uh, where I see us is in exactly that. Um, we know that we um, cannot predict um, what and how um, things are going to work out and uh, what is going to be the next primitive or what new primitives will come up on, as I mentioned, already existing infrastructure uh, like liquidity. 
I, I like to consider Liquity as an infrastructure project. Um, and that infrastructure is like a base ground. You can build a lot of cool things on top of that. Um, I don't think we are the ones that can build uh, a lot of those cool things because our industry is very, very rich on um, smart um, uh, people from all over the world. Um, but we are the ones working to make sure that that primitive that you build, um, it can be supported or directly connected to that traditional uh, finance system. So that's 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 where I see us. Um, I think of us as a middleman, but um, not a middleman, right? So it's just an enabler of um, options or opportunities that you already have in DeFi. And so, like, I, I love Holy Hell, by the way, and... Um just wanted to ask about like a couple of things one i put is it available to use globally as in you know the card is accepted anywhere um so the card itself is accepted anywhere uh but there's limitations as to who can get it unfortunately um and um we are working to uh, enable access uh, to more and more countries um so right now we are available in 31 uh, european countries and expanding uh, but uh, but yes, so that's that's the limitation of the traditional finance system. Um, there's really no uh, easy way uh, that you can onboard um, customers all over the world because um, one way uh, one thing is payouts to different countries like bank transfers, right? So for example, you can bank um, in uh, Germany and send the Swift transfer to Argentina, or um, have a bank account in Spain and you know transfer um, Swift payment to Japan. But um, the difference there is um, who you are a customer of. Um, and there's really no one global bank that uh, supports and that onboards um, all of the users. That's why even major banks, they have uh, subsidiaries in different countries with different licenses, with different um, you know, regulatory approvals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, that's the limitation of uh, yeah, so traditional fiat system. So it, it applies to us as well. So that's why um, you can um, you can be onboarded if if you are um, a European um, citizen resident. But um, uh, when you have the card, yes, you can transact with that card, uh, whatever Mastercard is supported, um, and that's pretty much pretty much almost um, the entire world. Awesome. And and just with regards to the sort of centralization vectors of something like Holy Held, like. Where does, let's say you, you know, and, and I totally agree with you, right, that like liquidity is sort of the space like a protocol, but I guess my question is, uh, wh where does, and, and oftentimes the problem with centralization is like anytime you introduce some sort of super centralized factor, it, it sort of throws out a lot of the ultimate utility of the kind of underlying protocol. If like, let's say, I don't know, your crypto can be rubbed in some way. So I'm curious to hear more of like the trustless nature of something like holy held and, you know, how someone would be able to transact uh, whilst also knowing, uh, using Holy Health, whilst also knowing that like, okay, you know, it's not like, because I, I noticed there's sort of obviously KYC and verification process and all that. Um, and so, you know, what confidence can people have that uh, they, they won't necessarily be rugged and, and the funds within Holy Health are going to be kept safe and, and all that. So, um, yeah, that's a very good question. I think we are um, like, like Liquity, uh, where, um, you know, and many other teams who are paranoid about security. Um, and we go uh, a mile or like an extra step um, to make sure that um, we uh, or you don't have exposure um, to any of our smart contracts. Um, what it means is that we have something called um, excessive allowance protection. Um, and uh, on the contract level, um, your uh, transaction, so basically when you want to top up the card, that top up transaction will revert if you try to give um, allowance, well, obviously smaller, but also larger than what's required for the transaction. So the goal is that um, after the transaction, your net um, allowance to that specific token that you want to use is, um, is zero. Um, what it means is that um, if, you, if something happens to our contracts, and we also have on-chain um, insurance, but besides that, we want to make sure that we can uh, programmatically guarantee that we do not um, have exposure or we cannot touch your tokens. Um, and that's what happens or that's what comes um, to the token side. Fiat side, obviously, it is regulated um, in a different way. So different rules apply to that. Um, uh, but, but yes, so we, we do make sure that um, your wallet is your wallet, your tokens is your tokens. There's no way you can import a seed phrase into us, so we're not a wallet. Um, you can only use your pre-existing wallet, the one that you trust, the one that you want to use. 
Um, if you like pain, I guess you can use MetaMask. If you, um, you know, like other wallets, you can use other wallets. But there's no way that you can import your seed phrase to us. And same thing um, for us is that uh, instead of going um, uh, like centralized, some centralized ex uh, entities that are happily uh, accepting your money, and then if they have any issues with you, uh, then they say and keep your money hostage and saying that, okay, well, now do what we say um, if you want to get your money back or if you want to use your money. In our case, it's different. Um, if we cannot serve you, we cannot serve you. Um, but and your money cannot be um, accepted or taken um, for that exchange. Uh, but if if um, you know if you are onboarded as a customer, then um, again you can only provide an allowance um, for the exact amount that you want to top of your card with. Um, and I think that's um, an important direction. So it does introduce friction. But as I mentioned, we are strong advocates of um, not your keys, not your tokens, and the same comes with the contract um, protection or contract security. Awesome. Nice, man. We're all excited to yeah, engage with that more, and hopefully you can roll out to Latin America pretty soon. Thank you. Yeah, we, we hope so, too. Very cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, in the interest of time, I have J.F. Sane. I think I, I, I have a uh, if you had a question, yeah, feel free to fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, so to me, I, I think like using DeFi for payments is, is sort of the r real holy grail that uh, pretty much everyone in this space is building for, but that uh, not enough people are really talking about. So uh, I'm very thankful for, for this space. Uh, thanks for putting this on. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm still forming my views on how I think this is all going to play out. But uh, just curious if you guys have views on, like, how will this payment space specifically evolve in terms of, you know, are we, are we likely to see this um, going through current payment rails? So uh, through credit cards, like you, we've been discussing in the past couple of minutes, or um, do you think that maybe it's going to eventually have to go through in some geographies through like DeFi rails? So I'm paying, you know, um, uh, DeFi to DeFi without having to go through like the TradFi payment rail um, and, um, are, are we also going to see this uh, sort of like do really well in some geographies? Uh, if so, wh which ones do you foresee? Um, and it's sort of like a global pushback against uh, DeFi payments. Um, you know, do, do you have any opinions on that or any other opinions in general on, on how this is likely to evolve? Um, I feel like you're the expert here with the rest of payments. I don't know if he's still around or if he can hear us. Um, it, so while he, while he, um, maybe Anton will, will chime in, but uh, I, I think it, it sort of depends. So I think there's two things at play here. So, and, and primarily has to come to do with the infrastructure that's currently available. So, you know, say like the holy held approach is actually leveraging the TradFi rails and saying that that's what we sort of want to operate on, at least as far as like value transfer from one entity to another. So if I want to pay like for a coffee or a beer or whatever, like it happens on TradFi rails. But um, by that said is, you know, that assumes that there's already this, this network that's been developed and built out um, whereby people can accept TradFi rails, but in places where TradFi rails are non-existent or they're really expensive, as is oftentimes the case in the global south, I think that's where we have the opportunity to, and, and this is the second point is like, think about the leap, leapfrog hypothesis that says, rather than having to go through card processors that charge high fees um, and eventually get to crypto, is let's just skip that first step and let's just go straight to crypto rails. So lightning uh, adoption, for example, you know, and this is the thing about like Bitcoin that I think is really interesting, is like, the Bitcoin meme, and this is oftentimes what it said, is like its strongest value proposition. And so imagine like telling someone, uh, as an example, like that you want to pay them on USDC on base that was built on the OP stack that settles on Ethereum. Like imagine walking into like uh, a bar and like explaining that to someone versus just being like, hey, can I pay you in Bitcoin? And, and maybe the transaction in either instance just happens seamlessly. But I do think that like we do have the opportunity to so to answer your question briefly is actually my belief is the answer is both like in places where we already have a lot of infrastructure which is the case in, in Europe and North America where holy held seems to be initially rolling out like 
you know, then that, that approach definitely makes sense. And I also think that we have the opportunity to sort of bootstrap and, and leapfrog um, entire like regions with regards to crypto native payments. You know, you're already seeing in Argentina, and this is sort of the web 2.5 uh, approach here where people use finance uh, for everyday usage. And we're already seeing a lot of activity with finance with regards to, hey, we see Binance Pay as being something of huge value and we want to continue to sort of ramp that up throughout the region. So, um, you know, I'd say the answer is both. And I don't think there, there will be sort of one generalizable approach. But I do think that the end goal for us is to be able to do everything uh, as natively as possible on crypto. I, I agree with Marcus. Um, it, it is indeed. I don't think there's a, there's a one uh, correct approach. Um, there's many different potential vectors, and um, uh, I think I think that's where the diversity needs to happen, right? So many different teams uh, approaching the same question uh, from different angles. Um, it is that my my biggest um, concern, or, or or if if I may say, a reservation as to how to really make um, DeFi as global um, payment means is, um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, the entire supply chain um, has to agree to accept crypto. Um, that's when. It will be really, um, I would say, like a, a, an adopted right or, or used solution. Um, if I can use the simplest example, right, of a coffee shop, um, it's the coffee for the coffee shop to accept your um, crypto in whichever fa- uh, you know form or shape. Um, it means that the employees of that coffee shop they have to be willing to accept salary in crypto. The uh, suppliers of those coffee beans um, also have to uh, accept crypto. Um, the government uh, with, to which the coffee shop pays taxes to also has to accept crypto um, and so on and so forth. And uh, if all of those uh, parts right in that, um, uh, you know, supply chain system, if they accept crypto, then the coffee shop owner uh, would be like, OK, well, I don't really need fiat. Um, but the really important um, point that Marcus mentioned is that indeed the existing rails um, and that's mostly um, mostly North America and um Europe, um, but there's so many more countries where, um, say, Visa, Mastercard, they they don't have an extensive um, network, and that's um, that's where crypto has this um, functionality and has the means to try to build up the crypto native infrastructure uh, cheaper, faster. Um, so probably that's where we'll see uh, the adoption of um, truly um, crypto native and crypto only um, transactions or uh, payments across the you know across the system. Just curious, in terms of Holy Held, um, how much pushback or cooperation have you uh, had from the the payment infrastructure? So, like, by from Visa and Mastercard, and then um, also from potentially from regulators. Um, yeah. So um, I think Europe is very um, clear on crypto regulations, and even more clear now with uh, Mika. Um, it is legal. There are uh, specific rules, specific regulations as to uh, what do you need to do and what you um, cannot do. Um, so it is legal. Um, it is legal to make money in crypto. It is legal to um, get paid in crypto, and um, it is legal to convert your crypto to uh, to fiat. Um, of course, there's uh, there's always pushbacks. There's always um, um, conservatism when new technology comes up, and um, we have to account for that. Um, but uh, I would say where the majority or where the most pushback is is uh, for countries that do not have. Um, a very clear um, regulatory framework, um, and uh, that that creates this a lot of a lot of this arbitrage um, in a sense that you know banks, for example, um, may not want to onboard you or work with you because you work with crypto, uh, even though it's legal and even though you still have to pay taxes, right, on on your gains in crypto or whatever. So I think it's just again um, more regulatory um, clearance on that, and that will solve um, questions. So. Yeah, and Nico, you have a question? Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, you can hear me well. Yeah, we can, yeah. Go ahead. Have like bad um, reception here now um but you were talking about and like uh on the regulation front um 
I'm, I'm from Bolivia. Marcus shortly mentioned like uh, how little bit the hard situation that we're living uh, there. And um, yeah, so basically I just wanted to bring up this uh, problem that is uh, crypto is sort of um, prohibited there where uh, banks, if they see that you have something in your account, they block your account, um, but it's not necessarily illegal. So, and right now the central bank in Bolivia is running out of dollars, like they're burning all the reserves. So people uh, cannot withdraw their dollars from the bank. So a lot of people are flooding a little bit to, to P2P because that's the way how people buy over there. But yeah, like it brings the entire problem that, that we had in this conversation about um, what can people do with that money aside from like protecting their wealth and uh, yeah, I, I I think this topic is like <laughs> can be used for a, an entire different Twitter spaces. But I just wanted to know, like I don't know if you see um, any potential solution that um, Liquidity can bring to that. Or um, yeah, I don't know. I would love to think about this together at some point because it's it's uh, <laughs> the economy in Bolivia is like crackling down and people. Well, it's a similar situation to Venezuela and Argentina. So. I think uh, there's a big opportunity to uh, save people's lives over there. So I just wanted to hear your opinion on that. I'm, I'm happy to just chime in here really quickly. Like, so just the way I see it right now, the situation in Bolivia is like banks will cut you out if they see you interacting with crypto. And as a consequence, there's no sort of like centralized exchange that will offer those services. Um, and then the question is like, how do you scale P2P and like what infrastructure or rails do you do that on? You know, I, I think partly, and the question then was like, well, what role could liberty play in that? Like, I, you know, the answer might be, well, if we encourage more adoption for folks who use LUSD in the case of, you know, a potentially alternative stable coin, um, they would be protected from the Bank of Bolivia at any point, sending some sort of order to a more centralized stable coin and saying, hey, any, any stable coin that has some sort of like recall function uh, or freeze function to say, hey, you need to like freeze this crypto that we know for sure was sort of brought on um, from Bolivian, like through a Bolivian bank, for example, right? So I think that that, that is where I see one front uh, as far as where something like liquidity could serve as, as like huge underlying potential is saying, we want to ensure that this stable coin is like fully trustless and there will be no interference from anyone. Um, so I would say that that's one intervention point. And then I think the other piece of like, you know, how you can on-ramp more folks and get them. Yeah, I think that's a super tricky question and I haven't quite come up with like a right answer yet because functionally you have to like do this on and off-ramp outside of the banking system. Um, and maybe that's where something like a solution that is analogous to Holy Hell could play into this equation, right? But that still relies and speaks to JF's original question. It's like, are we doing this on DeFi native rails or TradFi rails? And if we're doing things on TradFi rails, like, it's sort of hard to overcome that. And so, you know, if anything, it's like, well, how do we shift out of that um, and, and just focus on it driving more kind of DeFi native adoption? But I'm curious to get other people's thoughts on this. Um, that is actually what I wanted to ask the audience and kind of tap into the collective brain power um, as, as to what could Liquid do to enable better financial conditions and to uh, educate people and inform people about uh, LUSD and margin loans uh, against ETH, which is which is basically the, the primary use case why we built uh, liquidity in the first place. So I just wanted to ask the audience what what we can do. Uh, they are they they have the boots on the ground. I mean, I'm here in the Balkans, but here it's not as bad as as in Latam or uh, some uh, some other countries. Uh, what people do here a lot is uh, off-ramping P2P via Telegram groups, which are uh, very big um, comparatively to the to the size of the population. So that's that's uh, something that is rather um, advanced here, this use case. Uh, but just wanted to ask people, the, the audience here, what ideas they have. I know we have Pablo uh, Liquify up here in the audience. I don't know, Liquify, if you have any thoughts uh, with regards to how can we 
sort of bring more ma- mass adoption and, and create like safer exchanges of value from the real world into crypto and sort of or the TradFi world and into crypto and vice versa. I don't know if you've got any insights there. Natalie, I know you're also up here too, so would definitely love to hear folks' thoughts on, on that subject. Or Nico, like what have you encountered or what have you sort of ideated? I mean, like, you're probably the one with the most insight and both into the situation on the ground as well as uh, this whole ecosystem. So curious to get your thoughts too. Sorry, I quickly missed the question because um, I have very bad reception now. Um, sorry about that. I, I just kind of twisted your your question back to you. So what is your suggestion? What Liquidity can do to get more adoption? How can we help? Right. So I think um, a key aspect will be like to provide liquidity. Uh, I don't know, in let's say... Uh, Boliviano, which is uh, our currency and US dollars, um, like, I don't know, LUSD, for example, that would be awesome. But it has to be in a P2P market because, um, yeah, doing it. So, like, it has to be really decentralized and ensuring that there's no KYC involved. Um, and, yeah. Well, so, how do, you do, how do you do P2P in, in Bolivia? Are there groups or websites or what's happening? Yeah, it's mainly through finance fees. They're mon- they've monopolized it, and uh, that's basically the only way. So, just because the rates are also really bad right now, that everyone's flooding to USDT. So, just providing a P2P alternative would like make a huge difference, to be honest, um, and. Yeah, with my dad, we were brainstorming about some ideas about how this problem can be solved as well. Um, so, like, one of the things we came up with was, uh, for example, like, cards, uh, kind of like cards that you buy on the streets with, let's say, like, $10 that you can buy. And then, like, that's, uh, I don't know, have a, a self-custodial wallet inside the card and then be able to transfer it to your own wallet or something like that um, to make sure that it's, yeah, <laughs> out of the radar from the banks to not get your account blocked, basically. I don't know what you guys think about that. Uh, I can have, I live in the city, so I think I, I've i seen a piece of here. Uh, I think the P2P off-ramp on-ramp market is probably the way to go. I, I don't know if you've heard of one that, you know, it's called El Dorado, I believe. And they do on and off-ramps for, for USDT and USDC in Argentina and Venezuela. One of the things that they brought up to me and, and a few others have as well is having, I guess, LUSD available on layer twos so that off-ramping with the fees involved, it's, Obviously, the capital in Latin America is not the same as in Western countries. So being able to take out $200 LUSD into, I don't know, Argent- uh, Mexican pesos or uh, Argentinian pesos, it's it's it needs to be pretty minimal. Uh, and I think the way for us to probably help here at Liquidity is to try and uh, talk to these uh, different off-ramp providers uh to have LUSD as an off-ramp option, especially from layer two. Essentially now we have Arbitrum, Optimism, and ZK Sync as three chains where there's a combined liquidity of 10 million or so of LUSD. So that's pretty, pretty decent amount. I think, I think that's probably one of the, one of the ways to go. And I agree with your point, uh, Nico, as, as someone who's living in Mexico and who previously used to live in Bangkok, Thailand, the, the P2P market was the way to go. Uh, there as well when i whenever i used to off ramp from cent- some centralized stable coins or eth into into uh thai bot the option was to go into binance and then off ramp from binance uh but you know the, the problem there is that the whole kyc aspect of it is 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 a bit annoying to go through as well so yeah i guess to to keep the answer short i guess off ramp on ramps are probably 
probably the best best alternative indeed and and i think maybe we can if we think a little bit outside of the box i think um regarding the off ramps can we can come up with some interesting stuff for example you basically only need a place where people can spend their um i don't know stable coin right um you don't necessarily need them to uh, take them out because well uh, bolivia is like a half dollarized economy so there's a lot of things that you can buy with dollars um so if instead of like using uh dollars you you can pay them with with stable coin then that's already a sort of like off ramp and uh, you can have an economy sort of like running uh on crypto already you know um and i don't know like i, I think um moving forward we should start thinking as like protocol builders to also bring something on the ground i don't know like a supermarket <laughs> opening up a supermarket might sound crazy but i think that can be um a really interesting option or like just simply onboarding supermarkets to accept uh alternative methods uh of payment to allow these people to uh that use uh stable coins to protect their wealth to also spend it somewhere yeah i think that's what uh reserve protocol is doing in some countries latin countries they have some kind of app or infrastructure in place where people can pay with their token or tokens and then the the merchant accept them definitely and this goes to everyone like if you if you have ideas or thoughts like always you know feel free to slide into our dms or join our discord and we're always open to you know suggestions and ideas so yeah i just wanted to mention that as well yeah also open to do a spaces on on this topic i think it's a very important very interesting one but yeah we'd have some we need some more uh, information and and just material to discuss and interesting people to talk to cool i guess one i have one more uh, sam i believe he wants to have wants to uh, ask a question i think let's wrap it up after this one though as we are over an hour now So Sam will bring you up to stage now and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, uh sorry I I do I do have a question to Marcos uh, in regards to uh to the actual loan that was uh, took off. What what were your uh, uh, assumptions uh, to choose the the fr the the, the front end uh, provider? I I see that you that you use the Fi Saver if I'm not not, not mistaken. And but uh, what 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 are your assumptions and and also another question I'm I'm sorry for my English but uh, another question would be after I I took the loan and choose uh, the 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 front way the front end provider am I able to to change it uh, along the way or or do I rely on the on 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 this not sure if I if I was clear enough. <laughs> Yeah, so with regards to the front end, you know, really the intention with regards to how I chose how to, how to choose one. So as as you know, or you may know, Liquidity obviously doesn't charge, uh, doesn't have its front end as a consequence. A lot of front ends that do use it have uh, a kickback rate. Um, so meaning, you know, what what percent of the, the loan might they take as a consequence of running the front end. So uh, one DeFi saver has 100% kickback rate, meaning that they don't take a, a fee on top of that. But on, I'd say in addition to that, like DeFi saver is just a protocol that, and, or a front end I've used a lot to interact with different protocols like in a super seamless way. Um, I love that they kind of create a smart wallet for you as well that you can just use with, with a lot of ease as well, which makes transacting with DeFi saver much easier. Uh, so that's a bit of the thought process with regards to how I ended up using DeFi Saver. And then the second question, can you adjust your loan uh, as you have uh, once you admit it? Yeah, of course. I, I mentioned this at the sort of earlier on. But uh, what the really nice thing about DeFi Saver as well is it allows you to adjust your, uh, your position. So whether that is taking profit or including a stop loss and putting a trailing stop loss as well. Um, and a number of other features, there's a number of adjustments that you can make along the way. If you want to change the collateral ratio, if you want to reduce the amount of exposure that you have, if you want to take out a bigger loan as well. So there's a number of uh, kind of 
functionality uh, inter implementations that you can use on DeFi Saver. Thank you. Uh, but my in, in regards to the second question, Marcos, uh, let's say uh, uh, along the way the DeFi Saver stop uh, giving support. Uh, am I able to change the front end to other that are active or? Uh, I'm not sure if technically my my question makes sense, but uh, I just uh, in regards to the risk choosing one front end uh, instead of other. Uh, uh, if, if do I have to rely on DeFi Saver for the rest uh, until my my loan is closed or not? No, you can always you can always interact with the protocol directly as well, right? Um, so that that isn't wouldn't necessarily be like a, a risk for for you per se. Okay, I got it. But, but John, just one comment Boyan, if you on that. Have, yeah, speak more about that. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, DeFi Saver is a bit specific because uh, you can you can use uh, a normal wallet. You can create a proxy wallet or a smart wallet. This smart wallet then enables you to do automation. So if you use a normal wallet, you can see your loan on any other of the dozens of front end. If you use a proxy wallet, then no. Then Maybe you can see it on Instadep. I'm not sure about that. Or you interact via uh, contracts, as it, as you said. But as far as I know, the, the DeFi Saver guys are extremely reliable and have no intention of going anywhere. Okay. I, I think I understood. Thank, thank you, guys. Cool. In that case, I guess we can wrap it up. Um, it's been super informative, guys. Thank you so much, Marcus, for joining us in the spaces and sharing your insights. As Marcus shared in the in this uh, spaces itself, there are a couple of threads uh, along with the article piece that Marcus wrote on his whole process, the, the off the collateralization ratio he used, the front end he used, so the challenges he faced as well. Definitely have a look at that. And if you're a visual learner, he has also done a blog post, um, uh, sorry, a, a vlog actually in both English and Spanish as well. So if you would like to see, you know, him walk through the steps on YouTube, definitely check it out uh, as well. I'll again post the, the thread to both underneath the spaces. And thank you everyone for joining and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Great chatting. Take care. Ciao. ciao.